Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that book is called Augmented, Law, Augmented Reality Law, Privacy, and Ethics that uh, f forms uh, the rough outline of what we're going to talk about today, the, the topic of the same title. And, uh, and with me to talk about that is Dave Griesbach. And, and, and if, forgive me if I abbreviate our, our introductions for purposes of time. Anything else you want, guys want to add, let me know. Um, Dave is, uh, a, was a longtime member of the federal government in uh, the types of three-letter agencies that they're not allowed to talk about, but suffice to say that he has a, a great depth of experience in um, some very high-profile investigations and prosecutions of people that uh, use uh, virtual worlds, virtual currencies, and other digital technology uh, for bad purposes. Uh, currently now with Google in a, in a variety of uh, anti-fraud uh, capacities. Um, Dr. Jerry Lynn Hogue, ha, or Hogg is, is a media psychologist at the Fielding Graduate University. Um, has written a lot on, on uh, media related topics and its effect on psychology. And then uh, Dave Lorenzini is a um, uh, known quantity to many of us here and, and, and a long time uh, member of this community, uh, uh, entrepreneur behind the, uh, the Keyhole Project that eventually became uh, Google Earth and uh, since then a serial uh, entrepreneur and visionary in the field. So um, the, that we're, we, we come from a variety of different backgrounds and what we thought we'd do, we want to make this as, as uh, informal and collaborative as possible. So our goal here is to take these big picture issues of, of law and privacy and ethics and boil them down to something that you all can take away uh, some, some action items, some, some, uh, some takeaways that you can actually implement in your development of code, your development of apps, and, and, and what, whatever technology you're working on. So for that purpose, we're going to start off, I'm going to throw out uh, some factual scenarios and kind of throw it to the panel uh, to, to vet some of the issues raised by those, those scenarios. Uh, but after that, I mean, we've got plenty of things prepared here to talk about. Uh, we want to make sure that we're talking about the things that are of interest to you, of use to you. Um, so then we're going to open it up after that first scenario uh, to, to hear what, what you're encountering, uh, what your, your real life scenarios are. And uh, in failing that, we'll, we'll proceed on to the other things we have prepared. But uh, I, wanna, I wanna get to questions early rather than just saving the obligatory five minutes for Q&A at the end. So with that, uh, let's start out with the, uh, the scenario that we're envisioning a lot that is already starting uh, to, to be uh, in, in, in prototyping development right now, and that's the idea of, of virtual tourism. So uh, creating either virtual worlds, let's make that augmented, let's make it uh, uh, VR, uh, but it's, it's the, the, the uh, ability to visit far-flung places through augmented or, or virtual means, digital means. Um, and in here, we're, we're throwing out a scenario where we, we've captured various 360-degree uh, views of, of tourist attractions or, or commercial locations, uh, famous buildings in different cities, that sort of thing. And uh, we, we allow virtual tourism for a fee. So we've seen stuff like this going back even to Microsoft Photosynth. Uh, now we see a number of examples on all the VR platforms that are coming out, um, adding some, some augmented features to that. What, what, what issues do these raise? And I first want to talk about what happens when you're scooping up all this real world stuff into your virtual representation, virtual world. Um, from my perspective, uh, from the legal perspective and in and, and my practice specifically, for my, my mind first goes to the intellectual property issues, right? Um, and, and when we think IP in the AR space, most of us automatically think uh, patent. And that's obviously a very important facet of protecting your intellectual property. But now, when we're, when we're scooping up the world around us, we're talking about uh, duplicating uh, artwork, copyrighted artwork that's, that's in, our, in our space. Uh, we're talking about uh, people, trademarks that, that appear on, on various uh, locations um, around us. And, and uh, wh whether or not we can incorporate that real world stuff into our virtual world. Um, Dave Lorenzini, we, you and I have been batting around this issue for a while, and before I boil down to what I think the legal answers are to some of these issues, why don't you, so I'm not dominating the mic, why don't you tell me a, a little bit your thoughts of the types of stuff we should be worried about? Well, the, one of the similar things would be uh, the Google Street View cars, for example, running around and, and creating this version of reality with uh, 
with the cameras, the 360 pano cameras, and and you find very quickly that not only are there issues and um, that are dealt with on the privacy side by blurring faces and things like that, but you they vary from place to place. So you have very strict German privacy laws that that mean you need to conform to a higher standard, things like that. But it's a it's an amazing thing if you haven't picked up. Uh, uh, like a Gear VR headset or, or played with even just the cardboard viewers for VR, um, you'll quickly understand how much of the world we're going to model, which is all of it really, and, and then how much people are going to dive into those platforms. And initially it's a lot of spectating, it's a lot of seeing or, or virtual immersion like you're talking about, but very quickly we're going to be able to, to grab elements from those spaces or from other spaces and and basically mark up your view of the world, things like that. So there's, I think there's m one of my questions back to you was was, you know, what can I do? I have little applications on my phone where I can move my phone around an object, and I've just captured a model of that object. And if that's a trademark thing or a or a protected um, uh, piece of intellectual property, what can I do with that? And, and you know what's my exposure if I give other people the tools to do these things, but literally we're going to Hoover up the whole <laughs> Hoover up the whole world so that everyone can experience it remotely. And the best way to think about AR and VR is local and remote. So the line is blurring between it's all kind of XR um, experiences coming, but but AR is inherently a local experience, and VR is an inherently a, a remote experience of of some other place and. Um, we're about to go take people anywhere they want to want to go. So, really, the question is, how do you how do you do that in the right way? So, a couple of thoughts suggested by that conversation. Then we'll move on to a different topic. Um, I mentioned copyright. So, copyright, creative expression. You're right in your creative expression. That's art, the art, artwork that you're copying. Um, it's one thing when you take a photo of, you know, you're in the Louvre or something, you take a photo of a painting um, that, that's out there and you say, this is my personal collection, you throw it up on Facebook, something else like that. It's another thing entirely when you are uh, reproducing in, in, in high def uh, artwork that is subject to somebody else's copyright, whether that's a sculpture, whether that's a painting, uh, other kind of creative expression, music if you're recording an audio track uh, to this experience, and then uh, using that commercially. The, you, can, you can still infringe people's rights when you're not charging money for it, but when you're charging money for it, that's when you're getting people's attention. And, and they're, they're going to come try and get a piece of that money uh, on, the, on the basis that you're infringing. Um, Trademark. So you scoop up your um, your your copy your your ver this physical experience and you're uh, reproducing the things that are around you. And obviously, there's a lot of logos everywhere. Interesting thing here is that they actually have some some legal precedent uh, for using real world. Uh, trademarks in a recreation, uh, a digital recreation of the real world with some video games that are very immersive and that re recreate real life places. And uh, the precedent that we have suggests that that's okay. I mean, obviously it's not going to be true in every case. There's always going to be an exception. Uh, but a trademark is something different than a copyright. A trademark is something you use to indicate the source of, of commercial goods or commercial services. If you're not if you're not using that to do that, you're not saying this is a McDonald's video game, this is a video game or a VR experience that happens to depict the location of a, of a McDonald's, you're not really using that as a trademark. You're not creating uh, a, a likelihood of confusion is what the courts look for when they're looking for trademark infringement. So it's a completely different analysis, completely different animal, and, and thus the, the risk of liability there is, is, is different and, and I would ar argue lesser. And then the, the last topic that we can't really do justice to, but I'll, I'll mention is people, right? People are something that you're going to, to scoop up images of uh, when you're hoovering up the world around you uh, because there's a lot of people around you. Now, how you use those images depends on, on how your, 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 uh, what kind of rights you have. So if, if you are um, just scooping up 
pictures of people in the public domain, they just happen to be in the background, that's one thing. Uh, if you're, you're taking specific individuals or you're, you're, you're commercializing that likeness somehow, you're charging people to look at this likeness or you're, you're, um, you're, you're including people, like we talked about the other day, you would say, okay, well, this is a boring scene, so I'm gonna insert Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie into this one. Well, now you're, you're using a, a known quantity, a known identity uh, for the commercial value that it brings. That's what uh, the, the rights, the, that's called the body of law called rights of publicity or personality rights. That's what that looks for. Are you making, are getting some sort of commercial value out of a specific person's identity because of who they are, not because they just happen to be a face in the crowd. So takeaway here to this whole conversation is vet your content when you're, when you're making digital models of the real world. Don't take, by default, don't take what isn't yours, don't take what isn't in the public domain. And what public domain means is different depending on the types of rights that you're talking about. So let's move a, away from this a little bit and talk about um, how it is. You know, we talk about being sucked into this environment. How we're how we're we're immersion is 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 a word that's that's common in this in this conversation. Jerry, I want to give you a chance to talk about. What is it about this experience? And now we're, we're segueing a little bit from a, a legal subject to a more of, a, a, of e even an ethical subject. When we're designing these experiences, what is it about uh, the virtual experience, the augmented experience that is different for user, ex user experience? And, and how does that matter to the developer? What should they keep in mind when they're developing these experiences? Actually, we spend a lot of time doing research and we have several studies going out right now about that process of being involved in an immersive experience. But um, one, some of the things that you need to think about is that now that you are bringing visual and, a, and a sound and a variety of other things and putting yourself into the environment, that it's changing how we process that information. So we are, um, as humans, are down, boiled down to our core elements, you know, into that fight or flight. So we have to be concerned about now we bring it in as an emotional process, sometimes overriding our cognitive process, and what kinds of uh, concerns might be around that, you know, what will people react in ways that they haven't had a chance to first think through the process. Now Dave, um, we're now, now we're, I want, I want to ask you a, a way that these, these sorts of experiences can be abused. So you've got a lot of experience uh, hunting down bad guys in ways that we've not even known existed, uh, much less know how to, how to detect and capture it. Um, Let's talk about when these, when these virtual experiences are collaborative, they're social, they're platforms. We can go into these virtual worlds and collaborate with each other. Um, what are some ways that these, these, these types of platforms, these virtual worlds have been abused in, in either your experience or your knowledge? Um, and more importantly for this conversation, what can developers do ahead of time to curb that abuse or at least be ready to respond when, when government comes knocking? Sure, sure. Um, one quick thing, just so I uh, do get out of the way, my views are my own views, not of my current or past employer. Um, I think they'd like me to express that. But getting into uh, that question, sure. Some of the things that I have seen in the past is, uh, everybody remembers kind of some of these virtual worlds um, prior to the glasses and everything else that we currently have where it's an avatar moving around on the screen. I'm sure we can all think of at least one. Um, some of the things we've seen in that is actually a proliferation of sometimes um, illicit pornography, like child pornography, exploitation, exploitation of a minor, um, or even acting out um, that as a virtual reality, um, which can be of concern. I mean, there's... Um, a lot of ways that that information can be transmitted that is not tracked very well. Um, we've had a couple of things of tracking people who have unsuccessfully but wanted to do a bank robbery so they recreated this environment to go and set up a bank robbery. I mean it's not the smartest thing. Somebody's going to notice you building this bank and then doing the same thing over again and that's exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> But we've had other things where charitable donations um, or just financial frauds. We've had people where in one of the virtual worlds I'm thinking of, they actually 
uh, kind of like they do in real life, set up a fake ATM. And these people are going ahead and thinking that they're actually transacting when really they're just giving all of their uh, financial and uh, login information over. Um, some of the things that, uh, you know, also to be concerned with um, or as a concern for law enforcement and government is that uh, you might have a lot of these false positives where Brian and I were just talking about a popular game which caused law enforcement to actually detain a couple people because what they were doing was very suspicious when they were really just playing an augmented reality game. Um, but their activity because of what the game had them do made them look very suspicious. So I'm... Um, Moving forward in that space, um, you know, just think through those types of things. How could this get my consumer in trouble? How much anonymity and privacy should I allow? And how much is too much? How much is not enough? Um, and, you know, warn your users about, you know, hey, don't stand outside a police station and, you know, say, I have a bomb, even if it, that is part of the game. Don't, don't say, you know, be cognizant of your surroundings. You may be interacting in an augmented or virtual world, but you still live in the real world. So if I were to, to summarize that topic into some takeaways, uh, the first one that comes to mind is if it can be abused, it will be. Is that fair? Yep. Uh, so it, th think through what your creation and then think of the worst possible thing that somebody could do with that creation and assume that that's going to happen. Um, Dave, one thing I want to follow up, how, when you, you mentioned this bank robbery example, for example, they're, they're running through this virtual ATM robbery and, and people noticed it. How, how, how did they notice it, whether it's that situation or how, how do you go about detecting anomalous activity like that? Uh, a lot of times, actually, it's the users in the environment. Uh, report something out, something that is not suspicious or is suspicious. And a lot of times uh, what we'll see now even with like, uh, you know, game, um, not augmented reality games, but, you know, your typical, um, you know, app application games, you know, mobile games, sorry. Um, and even like Xbox, PlayStation, stuff like that is people actually like to police their own community because the people who are doing something fraudulent or wrong in the game actually kind of ruin that experience for the people who have paid good money to be part of your game and these people who are committing fraudulent acts and potentially shutting down the game they don't want in the environment so um, use your users uh, your users will give you great feedback on what the problems are in the environment and I'm going to throw it out uh, to the audience after this one more question because you raise an interesting point and, and I want to make sure that uh, Jerry gets a chance to comment on this before we move on to a different topic. And you raise the idea of pornography and, you know, by extension, other uh, illicit content that, that draws us in. And Jerry, um, it's, it's not news that you know, there, there's online porn, right? And, and the, the more digital, the more anonymous that a, that a platform gets, the more that kind of contact, content you're going to find. Um, Tell us, though, a little bit more about what you're seeing in your research about just how much of a problem this is, whether that's for the individual experience in that or whether it's for uh, society or third parties. And then um, maybe touch on a little bit of this debate that we were talking about even a few minutes ago of, you know, what effect does it have on users, not just specifically porn, but whether that's violent content or, uh, or other kind of listening content, uh, when you're experiencing it in an augmented virtual or reality type fashion rather than on a two-dimensional screen. Well, the studies that, um, that I'm aware of right now on both of those areas don't have to do with augmented reality. They have to do with um, on the internet. So uh, that definitely is an area that we need to continue to research. I would say de in the area of, of augmented reality, again, you're going to have a heightened response to the situation because you have additional senses that are being evoked during that time. But there is research right now that's, uh, that is talking about it's uh, young males are having more of a challenge sometimes entering into relationships because porn is so easy and available to that and so the challenge of of it's a lot of work of a relationship and so they're seeing a little bit higher trend there now as far as the violence video that's a big controversial area and uh, I actually um, 
am colleagues with at the university I'm at with some people that are on one side and then through the American Psychological Association where I'm the president of the division and friends with people on the other side. And I, I jokingly talk about the most uh, adamant, most violent area of research uh, on opposing sides is in media violence. Everybody else seems to say, okay, well, I disagree with you in media violence. They get violent about how they disagree. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, the studies right now are supporting that um, if you have someone that has certain violent tendencies, that by engaging in violent video games, that you might see some heighten. But as far as if, they, if those trends aren't there, if they don't have that kind of psychological makeup, we're really not seeing more violence from being involved in the games. So the question of do they get desensitized by that, we're not seeing that kind of thing. Now again, we have to do more research in augmented environments to, and VR environments to see if that switches things a little bit. I think, look, we're in an industry that the goal is to create the most realistic experiences possible. That's what all the software companies are driving for, the right lighting, the light shading. And I, I tell people by, by 2020, we get perfect vision. We get movie quality special effects and information in the, in the world around us at a level where you're going to have to lift your glasses to see if that's really Albert Einstein and Marilyn Monroe making out while we're talking about legal stuff, whatever. So literally the goal of this is to, to, to dupe, uh, you know, your human sense of perception and it's, it's just a crazy environment that we're going into. And it's good to hear about the desensitization uh, kind of stuff because it's a big question I have on, on behavior. But again, a lot of companies, purposeful AR is made to persuade and even advertising, I think we're, we're entering an age of, of make-believe. Literally, the advertising in the future is, is designed to make someone believe something using these senses and other kinds of drawn visuals. It's just uh, it's incredible, incredible time and impact. I, I actually think that a big area for research right now is that sense of presence. And what is it about that environment that makes us feel like we're there. So that's one of the areas that is ripe for research right now. Empathy too. Mm -hmm. when, one, of the main, one of the main things we're um, playing with is if, if I can show you something so real that you believe that it's, it's real, then I can make you understand it a little bit more. And if I can make you understand it, I can start to get you to care about it. And if I can get you to care, get you to care about it, then I can move you to action. And that's for, for good, right? So if I show someone, zoom in on Google Earth to Angola and show hungry babies, you know, you'd be almost negligent not to put a virtual blanket on them that would actually get a UN donation to that to help that cause. So you can really, you can use this power of, of visualization to generate empathy. And, you know, so it's a good thing, but uh, double-edged sword. So. Exactly. So I mean, we're really talking about t acknowledging the the reality of the situation, the perception of reality as a given, right? Because that's what our that's what our industry is. And I don't think that 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 anyone on this panel would say that the takeaway from this conversation is well, don't duplicate reality, right? Don't make um, don't make users feel immersed because that is a defining characteristic of the industry that we're in. We're, we're here to create immersive experiences, whether that's AR, VR, or something else. Um, but be mindful of, of the psychological, of the, the greater social result of the, res, the experiences that you're leading people into, right? Is that fair? I mean, in, in, in the violent video game thing, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, well, um, it's, it's not necessarily desensitizing to, to play a, a game on a two-dimensional screen where you're shooting people and killing people. Um, that happens as long as there's been video games. Um, but when we step up to the next augmented experience and it's that much more real, and we actually have to go through the physical motion of stabbing someone with a knife in order to kill the digital character. And if it's, if it's the perception is, I'm perceiving this as if it's real, well, what, what, what order of magnitude um, more impact does that have? Does that start to desensitize? Where's that line? Where's that threshold? Jerry mentioned that hasn't been studied yet. Uh, at the same time, though, Dave, um, if we're leading people into positive experiences, so there is, um, I'm blanking on the name now, but Journey was the name of, of, a, of, the, of an augmented video game that was uh, introduced a couple years ago. It was featured here uh, at, at AWE, and it was com a completely wordless 
game experience where you're, you're led on this like emotional journey to find r this character's redemption. At the end of it, you feel very moved, and that's a positive experience that you wouldn't have gotten without that immersion. So uh, we're, we're just, I think we're collectively calling for more attention, more, more presence of mind to, to, to think about the experiences you're leading your users to and realize that they're going to be more powerful, either for good or for bad, for them and for others, um, because of this new medium that you're working in. The power of that medium, um, as Spider-Man would say, has responsibilities. So um, we've got plenty of time left, plenty more here prepared to talk about. I want to give you the opportunity to direct the conversation, though. Who has questions, suggestions? Black Hat back there. So uh, right now you're talking about the reality of uh, augmented reality moving forward. You mentioned several uh, location-based experiences with Google Nest on PlayStation, and the reality is that it's going to start interacting a lot more with where you are in the real world and what your phone is doing and what you as a person are doing, and what is the legality speaking of all of the information that you're collecting from them, where the person is, what their history is, what the app is up, and what they're doing with their phone that entire time, mm -hmm. and how you allow for that experience to be immersive and, and feel that it's a part of your real world without, uh, you know, um, taking too much information. Okay, so we're talking about data privacy for the, 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 the sake of the, the audio recording. We're talking about how do, how, do you, how do you create this immersive experience where you're gathering necessarily because of the software causing this immersive experience, you're gathering all sorts of data about this person. And let's be frank, a lot of us, our business model here is to gather that data, right? The, the game experience or the virtual experience, whatever. I mean, that's, that's a way to dupe in the, the, the or to at least to draw in, let's, let's be clear. Nice. Um, the the user experience on a subjective level, so that they're giving you a lot of objective data that you can then monetize, right? I mean, that's how, that's how you get paid, and they enjoy the experience because of the content you're providing. But you're gathering a lot of information, and that's that's true of, of digital experiences worldwide in any format, uh, especially in AR, where you're now going to start gathering different types of data than what you had before. You mentioned location. Um, there, there's the, the, the more minute the experience gets, the more you're able to track the, the, through the gyros or whatever else. Dave, we were talking yesterday about um, magna magnometers and using those to precisely track uh, data um, through that indoor Atlas app, even more precisely, orders of magnitude more precisely than, than what had previously been um, capable. What, how much data is too much? Um, from a big picture legal perspective, I'll tell you in my experience, nobody knows that answer right now. Uh, the technology is proceeding far too quickly uh, for the law to keep up. But um, there, w in the absence of legislation, uh, th there are federal agencies stepping forward, specifically the Federal Trade Commission, uh, using its, its power to regulate unfair and deceptive uh, trade practices to basically draw its own lines of where it thinks it, the line is between fair and unfair data collection uh, practices and data um, reselling practices. There's, there's a case to look for right now. It's called FTC versus Wyndham Hotels. It's working its way up the courts right now. That is, that is right now the, the definitive proceeding on, in, uh, on where that line is and how are the courts uh, end up in that case is going to provide a lot of guidance. Uh, but right now, uh, ultimately, the, the answer is, uh, the, the first answer is you, you do what you think is fair until somebody tells you otherwise and then you get punished for it and <laughs> then you know. Uh, and then, which is not a great answer, but unfortunately it's what we're stuck with. And the, the second is a good rule of thumb when it comes to data collection is, is uh, disclose and disclose accurately. You, you let the user know somewhere in those terms of use, this is exactly the types of data that I'm collecting from you and how, and this is, this is the use that I'm putting it to. I mean, if you really stop and think about the just sheer amounts of data we're, we're collecting from people and, and all the different ways we're commercializing it right now, um, you, most users would probably be appalled or at least be put off by it. Um, but they don't stop and think about it. The question is, isn't, did, did they really d uh, appreciate the consequences of the data that they're sharing? It's, is there a written document somewhere that shows that you disclose it to them and they clicked a box that says, I agree? So as long as you can show that, you're going to be ahead of the game. Yes. Uh, so we go, Jerry, I'm sorry. You want to chime in on that? Uh, I agree with you about letting them know. I think transparency works quite wonderfully both in the relationship and building with your clients and then uh, as you said on a legal aspect of it. The other part of it, I would recommend not collect any data that you don't need. Just collect what you need and that's it. 
hold it, it all sorts of things. Exactly. Yeah. I was really struck by something in Brian's book on on your you literally have to disclaim that I think the example was L'Oreal makeup or something who had a just a makeup AR thing that that people could put on virtual makeup to t try products. You someone sued or something for unrealistic results or something so you literally now have this yeah you literally have have to disclaim that this this red bull thing that gives you wings will not make you fly or <laughs> literally but talk to that for a second that's that's and it it has to be totally obvious and in your face and i haven't seen it in a lot of ar apps but you literally have to it's a requirement, um, from what I understood from what you were writing about. So, can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah. To, like, how, to what lengths do I have to go through? It seems like I can't just hide it in a accept the terms checkbox kind of thing. Okay. So, yeah, that raises a different level of, uh, or different type of disclosure, rather. And there, there are lots of different things you can disclose and, and different reasons why you would have to. Um, the, the click box, the terms and conditions, uh, that satisfies your privacy disclosures under that set of law. What, what Dave's talking about uh, under marketing disclosures, fair marketing practices, that's a completely different body of law. You have to disclose different things for different reasons. Here we're talking about if you're portraying your good or your service as being able to accomplish a particular result, you better be able to deliver on that. And the question here, again, this comes primarily from the Federal Trade Commission as being the agency that enforces this. But they're looking for marketing practices that are unfair or deceptive, that somehow trick the consumer into making an uninformed or misinformed uh, buying decision. So the L'Oreal example is one, this was actually out of the UK, where um, there were billboards, uh, Christy Turlington, Julia Roberts, I think it was, uh, wearing this, this makeup, but they've been so, uh, so extremely airbrushed that the end result, that w what was on the billboard, just could not physically have been accomplished with the makeup product. And so they said, no, this, this is a deceptive advertisement. And it, it provides a great segue into the augmented uh, world because we have so many of these AR uh, makeup apps. And it gives a great uh, precedent, a touch point for saying, OK, how far is too far? If, if I show this makeup on the, in this app in this cartoony kind of way or just a way that isn't realistic, uh, I'm going to face the same liability for the same reasons. Um, uh, the Red Bull example. The Red Bull actually was sued not too long ago here in the U.S. for uh, its campaign, Red Bull Gives You Wings. Now, that, that's been a little bit over-reported. Uh, the, the, the I actually just had to advise a client on this not too long ago. The, the plaintiff didn't actually claim that he thought he would grow wings. Um, what he claimed was uh, Red Bull is obviously saying in its marketing that this, this uh, boosts your energy, your, your uh, mental performance, everything else. And his claim was, well, that, that's not true. It's basically, basically just a big caffeine shot, and the only benefit you're getting is from caffeine. And this, this metaphorical language of giving you wings is conveying implicitly some sort of message that they weren't delivering on. Um, Red Bull settled that one real quick, so we don't know whether or not that was true. Um, but that's, that's what's going on there. And the, the, the message there, I think, is the implicit messaging uh, that, that's, that's um, inherent in what you're showing in AR. If you're depicting something in a digital way and it's not lining up to what the real world product would, would, would look like or perform, um, then you can be in trouble. Yeah. You know, the technology ultimately gets easy enough to where your user becomes a developer. Hmm. That drives the law as much as every, everybody can be completely ethical. Uh, two examples, uh, there's a database of uh, sexual predators. Some good-minded citizen decided that he would go ahead and use AR to put a wanted poster on his neighbor's house, and he happened to get it wrong. Hmm. So even if he would have got it right, it's an issue. But here he got it wrong. There's a similar situation where a very progressive middle school, uh, not far from here, decided they teach all their young sixth and seventh graders how to use their asthma. Their kids, their middle schoolers, bad kids, and uh, they decided to use their asthma for very questionable things about some of the girls in their class. That's going to drive the law just as much as anything any developer may may do that's ethical. I, 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 uh, and I think you're right. Going back to the principle of if it can be abused, it will be. Um, and you, you're right. For the, 
the recording we're talking about, the ways that users can, can use AR platforms to harass others. And, you know, there are harassment laws that cover that. There are defamation laws that cover that. It's something else that we were talking about a lot in preparing this panel. How do I, if I, if I take I an augmented or digital representation of a place, a business, a person, and I add some commentary to that, some imagery to that to convey my feeling about them, my opinion about them, am I conveying something, a, a message that is, that is false and, and damages their reputation, and thus defamatory. Yeah, over here. Um, my name is Robert Hernandez. I'm a digital journalism professor at USC. And in online journalism, uh, we have comments, right? The comment thread. And uh, one of the things that kind of protected us was the DMCA Section 230, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And in that, essentially, it made publishers of a website you know, a dumb pipe, a platform that you're not responsible or liable if someone crazy went on and did defamation on, or, or threatened someone. Um, so we were covered in that uh, web, the website, right? Let's say the metaverse exists or in VR we create a platform that people can have these places to express themselves. Do you know of any laws that are going to protect the platform creators like the DMCA Section 230? Mm -hmm. Uh, good question. Uh, will will the the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, Section two or Section two thirty of the Communications Decency Act is one thing you're referring to, and then there's the DMCA, uh, both both of which lead to the same result, which is to take the liability off of a provider of of, of internet services uh, to. Um, that's just a platform. They just provide the platform. They don't have a role in creating the, the defamatory or the infringing content. Um, will there be something similar in an augmented platform? The answer is I sure hope so. Right, because the principle is the same. <laughs> okay, um, and, and but whether the current laws cover that or not is a gray area because at some point you're getting beyond the terminology that's in Wisconsin, yeah, you're t in these statutes, they're using words like publishers, they're using words like internet service provider. Uh, that, that contemplates a website, and that was written in a world where you only experience the internet through a website. Well, now you do that primarily through apps. And so, yeah, yeah you, you can probably, I think that there are cases, like, don't quote me on this, but I think that there are cases applying these laws to an app where you would experience an online experience there. But what if the online, what if the, the app isn't connected to the internet? What if it's on an intranet? What if it's on some sort of mesh network between mobile devices that you know doesn't go back to the pipe? Um, at, at some point, the, the digital experience that you're having, and I think this is a very near term point, is, is just going to be outside the language, uh, maybe not the intent, but certainly the language of these statutes. And then we're going to see some real creative plaintiffs um, put that liability all back on you, and and they'll probably be able to until the laws catch up. Thoughts on that, or yeah, here Stanford. Uh, you were talking earlier about the uh, privacy thing, referencing Google Street View as kind of an example of how a company is, you know, dealing with you know the world being captured and scanned. But I'm wondering about what happens once the cameras that are capturing these videos, the price continues to fall. They're consumer friendly. And I mean, just from the privacy stuff, even if there's no defamatory action being taken, I mean, who becomes liable if, you know, for the issues you're talking about earlier, if just if everyone can, can, you know, walk around and is capturing, you know, 360 video all the time? Okay, and if, may I understand the question, where, where does the, the liability for, for what specifically you're concerned about? Invasion of privacy? Mm -hmm. The problem sometimes is where there's a, a privacy complaint, you know, like let's say a uh, tourist goes to Germany and is taking video of their vacation in Germany. People don't like their, you know, stuff being scanned or whatever, but they're an individual. They're not a company like Google. So what happens then? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, ultimately, the the person doing the action is liable for the action, right? The results of the action. Um, David, you got thoughts on this? Or you're itching a little bit. Uh, look, look like you're ready to talk. I don't know if you're ready to jump in on that. It's saying no, I don't have thoughts on this. <laughs> it's it's literally I I think uh, it's such a slippery slope about uh, providing these kinds of tools because the 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 bar is going so low. All you're really going to have to do to manifest a realistic object in your environment is to say it and that will be translated to that object being in the room with you. So the bar is so low. You don't have to learn Unity. You don't have to, to do After Effects. You just say it and see it. And, and that's, we're, we're about to have these real world markup tools 
that are, it's, the first web didn't take off until we had these WYSIWYG tools where you could mark up a web page and then boom, exploded. The next one, same thing, except it's what you say is what you see. And that, that's when everything gets bonkers because literally say it and it's in the room. So, so you're providing a platform to someone that you could instantly manifest something very beautiful or very uh, horrendous, you know, in the same breath. And what's your liability on, on some of that? You just say, you know, we, we want you to abide to a good code of conduct or something. It, and even if you do that, the tools are out there. You know, we, we totally expect the a dark web kind of uh, HMD device where you just put on these dark glasses and now you're seeing something that only your little network can see. So how do you control that? I mean, it's literally where the cat's out of the bag as soon as we, we, we go down this road. And I don't know that the legislation is going to stand up to the, the shock and um, offense that a lot of people are going to feel. I don't know. It's just it's going to be real tough. So This doesn't directly address the, the legislation and, and that concern, but I think we're going to eventually get to a new normal, just like you were saying. Totally. You know, the, 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 it, we just won't be able to control something like that. And also the idea of digital trash. I mean, if, if in, indeed everybody's doing it, then how are you going to be searching through all this information to do it? So it doesn't prevent you from maybe harassing one person or something and have individual cases, but it'll have this wealth of digital trash out there too. Yeah, you, you get to a point where it's, it's not private, but it's certainly obscure, right? And, and the, the new normal, that's a great point. From a legal perspective, the, if you're invading somebody's privacy, it depends on whether or not they had a reasonable expectation of privacy. And so when, when our circumstances change, with the ability to gather information, do uh, things with that information changes, necessarily then what's reasonable to expect is going to evolve as well. Um, we have time for one more question. Yeah, you know, the reception doesn't start until 6, so I've, okay. this is going great. Let's take another 5, 10 minutes. Good deal. Ma'am. Uh, to follow on what you were saying, isn't that, um, won't it be helpful from where you're sitting just to look at an individual's data trail? I mean, that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And can't that help you in these instances where it goes down a dark path? We're talking about view streams, kind of access to that view stream. It might be difficult, but but knowing what someone's visualizing at some point might be a requirement of a system that's publicly available to have that kind of look. We're taking precautions to be able to show that you don't allow the nudity in a in a platform that children might access or something, whatever. So, uh, but you, um, is that a requirement of the system if you're going to deploy an AR platform? Uh, I don't know. I mean, speaking a little more on that, too, um, you know, some of the issues that uh, have been presented is working in a virtual machine environment where a lot of these things don't exist for more than the couple of nanoseconds that they were created. Um, you know, so the thing is, is I don't know that you could even have a sustainable model where every single view stream you have is logged and saved for an extended period of time. I mean, I can't imagine the data set, <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. And then, I mean, you have, can, right, so you kind of have to have that. I mean, I'm also thinking this through. I mean, you can even, like, DDoS a system by just trying to generate massive amounts of data and knowing that, hey, there's a legal requirement that you save this data. Um, I don't know. It, it could be a very slippery slope. Well, I'll tell you, and this is something I've, I've written about a bit, too, from out of my everyday legal trenches of, of doing civil litigation, uh, especially for intellectual property. Once, once there's a, a threat of a lawsuit or an actual lawsuit filed, the notice goes out to the, the service provider, the company, the employer, whoever's involved. You need to start saving this data. Right, suspend all your deletion um, protocols, uh, and all this stuff starts getting accumulated, and eventually it gets discovered in the course of litigation. And you know, we thought we had enough to do now with emails and everything else. I mean, it's going to be absurd <laughs> the amount of data we have to sift through. So it's going to have to happen by automated means. So all of you out there creating apps, the, the growth market there. Um, 
But, but the, so the, the type of data, like what you're suggesting, where we're not going to be just looking necessarily for an email sent or a message written, you know, it's, we're going to have to coordinate. Not, not only did this person see something on his AR glasses, for example, but which direction was his head facing, right? Because that matters. It, 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 this data looking this way means one thing. If I'm looking this way and it's superimposed on what was over here, that's a completely different uh, experience. Dwell time, yeah. How long did I look at it? Did, can you prove that I actually saw it and paid attention to it, that it registered, or that it just flashed across my screen? Um, it, Was it purpose?ful Sure, purpose?ful I mean, all sorts, and you can't answer those questions without connecting a whole lot more dots than what we deal with now. So then that begs the question, and I think Jerry Lynn, you've spoken about this before. In the end, will it all matter? Is, is copyright and trademark something that's going to become passe. Yeah, that's that's usually when I get everybody throwing things at me. But, um, and especially with a lawyer who <laughs> makes his living off of this. But um, back to that new normal, I wonder if this is the time that we need to start thinking of ways of being able to compensate the, the content creator, the designers, all the people along the way in a different way than we have been it's because it is so easy and prevalent to be copy and pasting, to be um, changing around even when you first started out and talked about uh, creating these environments and whether we can to right, right, pictures and things like that. So maybe we need to start thinking about how we compensate, how we acknowledge uh, the creator and maybe you know, generate um, income for them in a different way than we do it now. I don't have that answer. Yeah. <laughs> you do, though. Well, no, 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 just a point. I, 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 I look for parallels, right? So I think <laughs> the Creative Commons, the di you're going you're gonna to fall into certain types of use um, and fair use and other things uh, that you that you publish under, I guess. So, but by its nature, it's very iterative. Um, one, I, I fully expect my kids to be authoring worlds just like they do in Minecraft, but in, in the real world. And then to have their friends build off that, um, it, it's just by its nature, it's very iter iterative. And, and I like your point on, on how that, how that's allowed to happen or, or motivated and things. It's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and Google has even uh, kind of tested the waters here with its patent on the pay per gaze uh, method of, uh, of payment. They, they actually obtained this patent where you look at something with your Google Glass for long enough and then that's, that counts as a click, right? So that the advertiser gets money off of that. <laughs> what if you just thought about looking at it? <laughs> There is actually a method of measuring that as well, and that'll be that'll be next. Um, more thoughts, more questions. I'm sorry. Was it was yeah over here? At some point, somebody's going to do some physical harm to themselves while being distracted by yes. Yeah, so when somebody hurts themselves because they were distracted by augmented reality, I think that's chapter seven in my book. Uh, but yes, that's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and there are all sorts of precedents in other sorts of digital media, right? Like our phones and people walking off the ends of piers because they were looking at their phone. Um, in, in the automotive space specifically, right, that's where the most immediate opportunity is for distraction and, and, and therefore injury. And uh, I'm actually, I don't have the answer for the, the yet yet, but I'm looking into it. I'm actually uh, trying to get an appointment with NHTSA to, to talk about that, figure out where the, the, the lines are. And that's something where that uh, this organization a, as a group, AR.org, is, is starting to look as one potential area where you know, maybe we can get together as an industry and, and start expressing our opinions on this stuff, where we think the lines are and where we think we ought to be able have freedom to innovate, to add to the driving experience, to make it more safe with windshield displayed information, where, where doing the studies that, that say, hey, this isn't distracting, this is actually improving the experience. But yes, yeah, so there's, there's a lot, of, there's a groundswell to, to figure out what those rules are. And th that's something that we can tangibly, this year together, impact. Okay. I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. This is very thought-provoking, and I think uh, 
uh, AWE could do a whole track on this. It's, there's a lot to think about. Thank you very much for your participation on this panel. Um, 